we'll get started. Welcome to the Wilson Center. Welcome to this history and public policy uh, program seminar that we're uh, jointly sponsoring with the Kennan Institute and the Cold War Project um, and uh, uh, I'm sure a number of other uh, units of the Wilson Center. I'm Christian Osterman, the Director of History and Public Policy Program. It's a great uh, pleasure to welcome you uh, to this um, event, book launch for Cold War on the Home Front, the Soft Power of Mid-Century Design, with author Greg Castillo and my colleague uh, Blair Rubel. Let me introduce both of them and then give them the floor um, to uh, uh, talk about the book and uh, with some comments from, from Blair, and then we'll open it up uh, to questions and comments from all of you. Greg Castillo is an associate professor at the College of Environmental Design and at the University of California, Berkeley, and a research associate at the United States Studies Center at the University of Sydney in Australia. He has received uh, host of grants and fellowships, including uh, grants from the German Fulbright Fund, the Getty Research Institute, the Canadian Center for Architecture, and the Ford Foundations. He has a number of publications on Cold War design, politics, and practices to his credit, including Cold War on the Home Front, the soft power of mid-century design that we're launching here, and essays in imagining the West and Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, Cold War Modern, Art and Design in a Divided World, 1945 to 1975, and The Politics of the Kitchen in the Cold War. Um, he'll be uh, giving sort of an overview of some of the findings, and I think he has a PowerPoint prepared with some um, visual materials to go along. Then we have the great uh, pleasure to um, welcome one of our very own, uh, Blair Rubel, um, who, of course, is the director of the Ken Institute here at the Wilson Center, and he also serves as program director relevant in this context for the Comparative Urban Studies uh, program. He received his uh, degrees in political science from the University of Toronto and uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, he has a long, long list of uh, books and publications to his credit. Uh, let me just highlight um, a couple of them. Uh, they include a trilogy examining the fate of Russian provincial cities during the 20th century, Leningrad, shaping a Soviet city, Money Sinks, the changing politics of urban space in post-Soviet Yaroslav, and second, Metropolis, Pragmatic, Pragmatic Pluralism, in Gilded Age Chicago, Chicago, Silver Age Moscow, and Meiji Osaka. Um, most recently, of course, he has published the award-winning uh, Washington's U Street, a biography, um, and uh, so it's a, with great pleasure that I welcome him to the program as our commentator. Uh, he too has a host of fellowships and um, grants to his credit uh, there on the full of bios on the handout uh, and on the website. So without further ado, let me turn it over to our two speakers. First, Greg, and then Blair. Thank you very much for being here. And in the next half hour, I'd like to take you on a sort of brief tour of one of the uh, major points of argument in this book. Uh, I've actually eliminated most of the East Bloc responses to uh, the Western provocations just for the sake of time, but if you're really interested in those, you can take a look at them in the book. So let me start by saying pacifists have long dreamed of marking an end to war by forging plowshares, of course that's tools, from deco decommissioned weapons. But a surreal reversal of that notion is the subject of my monograph, Cold War on the, Cold, uh, Cold war on the Home Front. It looks at how after World War II, the US and the USSR forged propaganda weapons from electric stoves and living room lamps. And you see that idea depicted in these two images from the 1959 American National Exhibition in Moscow, which featured no less than four model kitchens. In this pivotal but often overlooked theater of Cold War conflict, 
both of the superpowers enlisted the hardware of domestic consumption to proclaim the benefits of their respective economic systems. During the Cold War, new household furnishings, or the scarcity thereof, were much more than just symbols of either consumer capitalism or socialist collectivity. Domestic objects served as the daily life incarnations of the superpowers and their competing economies. There is something, of course, inherently absurd about the idea of waging a war with electric toasters and upholstered furniture. The comedic aspects of this conflict were beautifully captured in David Reisman's 1951 uh, parody, The Nylon War. This is a short story about an American military campaign to bombard Russia with consumer goods rather than explosives. Reisman described his fictional US battle strategy as, quote, both violently anti-Soviet and pro-peace. Quote, behind the initial raid was an idea of disarming simplicity that if allowed to sample the riches of America, the Russian people would not long tolerate masters who gave them tanks and spies instead of vacuum cleaners and beauty parlors. The Russian rulers would thereupon be forced to turn out consumers' goods or fast, face mass discontent on an increasing scale. The outcome of the war, as the story ends, is a new Soviet economic policy severely straining communist resources. Quote, the Russian people, without saying so in as many words, are now putting a price on their collaboration with the regime. The price, goods instead of guns. Less than a decade after its publication, Reisman's comedy came to seem prophetic. Russians got their first taste of US consumption at Moscow's 1959 American National Exhibition. Its samples of high culture were dwarfed by a spectacular display of cosmetics, clothing, televisions, kitchens, tract homes, soft drinks, mail order catalogs, processed foods, canoes, sailboats, and automobiles. On an opening day visit, Nikita Khrushchev lost his composure when confronted with a lemon yellow, all electric GE kitchen. In a face-off with his host, Richard Nixon, Khrushchev declared that the US had no exclusive franchise on advanced domestic technology. Quote, in another seven years, we will be on the same level as America. When we catch up and are passing you by, we will wave back to you, end quote. US officials proclaimed their Moscow exhibition, quote, the most productive single psychological effort ever launched by the US in any communist country. However, as I demonstrate in Cold War on the home front, the kitchen debate was that battle's parting volley rather than its opening shot. Although historians have conventionally traced the Cold War deployment of weaponized household goods back to Moscow's kitchen debate, tract homes and their furnishings were inducted into America's propaganda arsenal a decade earlier in divided Berlin. Their home shows exposed West and East Bloc citizens to the Marshall Plan's social contract, which equated rising private consumption with good post-war governance. At Berlin's Marshall Plan home shows of the early 50s, as you hear, see here on the screen, the US developed the propaganda strategies applied with such galvanizing effects at, in Moscow at the decade's end. U.S. military occupation of post-war Germany faced a two-front cultural battle. European intellectuals saw America as the source of, quote, a primitive, vulgar, trashy Massenkultur, which, in effect, was an Unkultur, whose importation into post-war Europe had to be resisted, in the words of historian Volker Berghahn. Soviet propaganda, the second front of America's cultural Cold War, exploited European prejudices by depicting the US, the U.S. as a military empire ruled by parvenus. And much more was at stake here than just national pride. The towering of American consumer culture subverted the Marshall Plan for Europe's post-war future, which was based on Fordist linkages between democratic particip uh, political participation, high volume mass production and the reward system of low cost mass consumption. Or as phrased by Paul Hoffman, the former CEO of Studebaker, who headed the Marshall Plan's European recovery program, quote, today's contest between freedom and despotism is a contest between the American assembly line and the communist party line. So let me uh, explain very briefly this uh, little diagram of the virtuous economic circle that Marshall planners intended to install in Europe. Uh, it starts with 
productivity by workers. Productivity needs to be raised. If it, workers are enfranchised, they can produce more. They'll produce more high volume, <coughs> low cost uh, production, which then will yield low cost mass consumption, which further enfranchises workers, and then they produce more. So this was an attempt to intervene in uh, communist labor party uh, strategies to basically bring down the Western uh, production machine. A 1947 Army Intelligence report examined Soviet propaganda that ridiculed the American way of life. It recommended that the U.S. initiate a campaign of counter-propaganda built around the themes American living standards and try it our way. Within a year, American authorities began planning their first housing exhibit for post-war Germany. S titled So Wont America, or How America Lives, the show seen on the left, opened in Stuttgart in 1949. The exhibition designer was Josh Schmidt, a former Bauhaus instructor employed as chief gra graphic designer at the US Exhibitions and Information Center in Germany. Despite this stellar design talent, the exhibit attracted only a modest audience. Photos and models of suburban homes, as it turned out, neither captured the imagination of the West German public nor dissuaded elites of their belief that the American way of life was culturally infantile. The head of the U.S. Information Agency in Frankfurt recognized the exhibition's underlying error, noting, quote, if real, honest-to-God electric stoves, refrigerators, and deep freeze units had been on hand, the general attendance figures would have been astronomic. Demonstrating U.S. middle-class affluence using a completed uh, furnished suburban tract home was the next step in America's escalation of cultural weaponry. For the first annual German industrial exhibition in 1950, Marshall Plan advisors planted a prefabricated tract home from Minneapolis, seen on the right, outside West Berlin's George Marshall House, America's new trade fair pavilion. West German carpenters working round the clock assembled a kit of prefab building components in just five days, showcasing American advances in productivity. When the America at Home exhibit opened its front door, the little Midwestern prefab was promptly mobbed. A huge uh, deluge of visitors uh, prompted the U.S. sponsors to post policemen at the front and back doors in order to limit crowds, uh, which in aggregate could crack the home's timber floor joists. Ten attractive female students from West Berlin's Free University were chosen as tour guides and trained to answer questions about, quote, household miracles such as the electric washing machine, illuminated electric range, vacuum cleaner, toaster, etc. In the two weeks the, German, the exhibit was open, it was toured by 43,000 Germans, a third of them from communist East Berlin. The number of visitors from the East came as no surprise to U.S. officials and was part of their exhibition strategy from the start. Until the infamous wall went up in 1961, of course, Berlin was an open city. U.S. officials scheduled the model home show to coincide with East German elections, a work holiday. Special low-cost admission for socialist citizens provided an incentive to visit and allowed U.S. advisors to track East German attendance. State Department officials judged the result, quote, a gratifying demonstration of what can be accomplished in selling the American democratic way of life from the Berlin showcase behind the Iron Curtain, end quote. As a publicity stunt, the Office of Germany's U.S. High Commissioner planned to dispose of the home at the close of the fair through a raffle. In Washington, however, U.S. State Department's uh, Department officials feared, quote, the possibility of the house falling into undesirable hands, and the raffle was canceled. The American suburban home had been officially inducted into the nation's Cold War arsenal, and like any other strategic weapon, it had to be secured against unauthorized use. The grandest Marshall Plan consumer extravaganza was the 1952 show, Wir bauen ein besseres Leben, We're Building a Better Life, held again at West Berlin's Marshall House. All model home furnishings were modernist in design and manufactured in a Marshall Plan member nation. The show's theme was the standard of living that could be attained through higher productivity and trade integration of, quote, the peoples of the Atlantic community. The main attraction of the show was a single family dwelling realized down to its kitchen gadgets and garden tools, but built without a roof. A narrator dressed in white and perched in a crow's nest, who you can see on the upper left, 
describe the model family's interaction with their domestic environment. A sign in German posted on the wall at lower right explained, in this house are industrially, industrial products from many nations in the Atlantic community. Thanks to technology, rising productivity, economic cooperation and free enterprise, these objects are available to our Western civilization. The house was a stage set for the domestic life of a quote, average skilled worker and his family, and was manned by a model family in the literal sense. The model housewife, her husband, and their two children were all professional models or actors hired to enact the household tasks and leisure rituals of a consumer wonderland. Visitors became voyeurs, looking through windows or down from an overhead catwalk to observe the ways in which modernist objects constituted their subjects. A billboard featuring a male laborer introduced the second part of uh, We're Building a Better Life. Captioned, this man is a worker and at the same time a consumer, the display served as a reminder of the lack of material rewards for comparable East German labor. In this part of the exhibition, furnishings could be examined at close range as a shopper might. The display was said to demonstrate that, quote, rationally designed products from different countries in the Atlantic community can be combined harmoniously. And just as these items from the various countries combine to form a homogeneous whole, so the nations themselves can combine to form a homogeneous community. The lesson then was that post-war affluence went hand in hand with barrier-free trade and cosmopolitan attitudes toward national identity. In the Better Life Gallery of Furnishings, every household object came with a tag indicating country of, or, uh, country of origin, retail price, and the number of hours of labor, as measured by a skilled worker's wage, needed to purchase the item. The seeming, seemingly guileless calculation of purchasing power entailed a fundamental assault on Marxist ideology. A second lesson in political identity pervade through modernist household goods. Marx, of course, had used the concept of labor value to define capitalist manufacturing as exploitation. According to Marx, retail profit was derived from the unpaid labor that industrialists appropriated from workers. But at the Better Life show, Marshall Plan officials approached labor value as the amount of labor needed to purchase an item rather than to produce it. This shift from production to consumption radically redefined labor value as a measure of capitalism's reward system rather than of capitalist exploitation. As demonstrated at the State Department's Better Life exhibit, modern furnishings repudiated not only socialism's lower standing of standard of living, but also Marxist economic theory. For the East Bloc, Khrushchev's dismantling of Stalin-era autarky gave American domestic design new relevance as a resource rather than a mere object lesson in cultural degeneracy. At the Geneva summit of 1955, Khrushchev and Eisenhower launched a new era of bilateral cultural exchange. Of course, each side intended to use the agreement to its own advantage. Eisenhower's advisor on psychological warfare, C.D. Jackson, proposed that Washington, quote, deluge Moscow with invitations to the U.S. and predicted that Soviet visitors would return, quote, if not convinced, at least profoundly perturbed, end quote. The Kremlin's agenda for such visits focused not on propaganda, but on technology transfer. Within weeks of the Geneva summit, the Soviet Ministry of Construction had accepted an invitation extended by the U.S. National Association of Home Builders to host Russian housing officials on a tour of U.S. building sites and construction supply factories. A 10-member delegation headed by the Soviet Minister of Construction arrived in the U.S. in early October 1955. Over the next weeks, the group toured sites from Virginia to California. The Soviets enthusiastically noted and photographed every construction process shown. At a typical suburban site, according to their hosts, quote, the Reds swarmed over the slab, dodging partitions and roofing sections as they came off the truck, reaching up to gauge ceiling heights, examining heating, wiring, and plumbing connections. At visits to supply plants, the Soviets placed orders for hundreds of items to be shipped to Moscow. But of all the items on the Soviet wish list, none astonished their hosts more than the completely furnished model home that the delegation seemed determined to purchase. 
The first inquiry took place in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where an incredulous developer demurred, insisting that he had no export experience. But the prospective home buyers were more successful in California. At Rollingwood, a Bay Area development, the Soviet Minister of Construction found a three-bedroom split level that he called delightful. He ordered the home's unassembled components shipped to Moscow, including heating and air conditioning equipment, a GE electric kitchen, all display furnishings from dinette set and sectional sofa to television, floor coverings, and bathroom fixtures. Freight costs and optional extras brought the total to $40,000. The unfazed Minister of Construction told the developer, quote, just send the bill to the Soviet Embassy in Washington. In 1956, after a year of red tape, containers filled with the assorted parts of an American dream home left San Francisco bound for Moscow. What happened to the Rollingwood home upon arrival remains to be gleaned from Soviet archives. But the delegation's report, which is known, praised U.S. suburban housing, noting that its occupants were often working class and of average income. For the next three years, Eisenhower's Cold Warriors dreamed of deploying a dream, uh, an American dream home behind Soviet lines, despite having been beaten to the punch by a delegation of Russian bureaucrats bankrolled by the Kremlin. In their quest to exhibit the American way of life to East Bloc audiences, U.S. propagandists faced nearly insurmountable barriers imposed not by Soviet administrators, but by their Washington counterparts. A new McCarthy-era Republican Congress convinced that the federal government had been infiltrated by, quote, socialists, misfits, and perverts, gutted the budget of the U.S. Information Agency in 1953, its founding year. To salvage U.S. cultural diplomacy from a Congress incapable of managing its soft power assets, Eisenhower devised what historian Robert Haddo has called a, quote, McCarthy-proof propaganda strategy. The president created an Office of International Trade Fairs, or OITF, removing these operations from the beleaguered USIA. The new agency was depicted as merely supporting U.S. private enterprise abroad. To work on its shoestring budget, the OITF secured product displays from private industry, like the RCA Miracle Kitchen seen on the upper left. OITF designers reassembled these product showcases into thematic displays and oversaw their installation at international trade fairs, where suburban homes were again deployed as the emissaries of an American way of life. The privatization of federal propaganda efforts indeed eluded McCarthy and company, but came with unintended consequences. The practice of assembling official U.S. exhibitions from corporate uh, donations provided a de facto federal endorsement to any business willing to pay for it. House Beautiful donated two model homes, like the one shown on the lower left, for overseas use. Simultaneously, the magazine produced a color foldout celebrating its newfound role in federal diplomacy. And with these repurposed displays, design experience gained in a previous generation of purpose-built home propaganda was nullified. For example, the Made in America exhi exhibit at the 1957 Poznan Trade Fair, shown on the right, uh, their visitor demand exceeded the carrying capacity of the model home donated by House and Home magazine, just as had happened six years earlier at West Berlin's America at Home installation, the very first showing of an American model home in Europe. To resolve the human gridlock, exhibitors changed the visitor route. After a quick walk through the living room, as you see on the right, sightseers were shown the door and shunted outside. Crowds glimpsed all other interior spaces through perimeter windows. To maximize views, all interior doors were removed. Tour guides had to explain that while the open kitchen was indeed an, an American innovation, a total lack of bedroom and bathroom privacy, in fact, was not the national custom. <laughs> the Eisenhower goal of scoring a propaganda strike, quote, as close to Moscow as possible, was realized with the 1959 American National Exhibition in Moscow, made possible by a 1958 Soviet-American cultural agreement. American and Soviet negotiators hammered out the uh, bilateral exhibition protocols through grueling rounds of negotiations. The Soviet delegation scrutinized every detail of the U.S. proposal for a Moscow exhibition and vetoed many of its specifics. Chad McClellan, the former head of the Office of International Trade Fairs, who organized the Moscow event, noted, quote, 
I've been in many tough negotiations, and the moments put in by the Soviet team match the best. McClellan's production team included Jack Macy, a USIA veteran, and modernist design luminaries George Nelson, Buckminster Fuller, and the husband and wife team of Charles and Ray Eames. Their exhibition design, intended to convey the superiority of the American way of life, uh, was done through a coordinated media and consumer cultural narrative, and it was a propaganda masterpiece. The tour opened with a multi-screen spectacle displayed in Fuller's geodesic dome. The Eames documentary, Glimpses of America, depicted a typical week in the life of a suburban resident, a presentation devised to establish credibility for the display of material abundance that followed. Emerging from the hypnotic dazzle of Fuller's information dome, visitors entered a glass-walled where, glass warehouse described by its impresario, George Nelson, as, quote, a bazaar stuffed full of things, the idea being that consumer products represented one of the areas in which we are the most effective, end quote. A two-story scaffolding uh, displayed merchandise donated by hundreds of corporate sponsors and mobilized American consumer abundance to combat Soviet advances in technology and heavy industry. Exiting through the back of the pavilion, visitors encountered a two-tone suburban home donated by Allstate Properties, a Long Island developer. American reporters dubbed the house Splitnik, a name referring to the 10-foot wide gangway that bisected the home, allowing crowds to pass through at ease while viewing interiors furnished by Macy's department store. Within Splitnik, the narratives conveyed in the previous exhibitions converged in a physical evocation of the American way of life. Wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, contemporary furnishings, and consumer electronics provided a sampler of affluence for the capitalist masses. It was besides Splitnik's all-electric kitchen that Nixon engaged Khrushchev in the historic kitchen debate, an event proclaimed an American triumph by the American media not to mention on the pages of Nixon's pre-electoral autobiography, Six Crises. Similarly, a recent historical account <clears throat> maintains that, quote, nothing had prepared Soviet officials for the exhibit that the U.S. mounted in Sokolniki Park. Any notion of an American surprise attack on unprepared communist leaders is clearly untenable, given the Soviet import of a fully furnished suburban home just a few years earlier. A comparison of the Rollingwood kitchen at top right and Splitnik's kitchen debate site just below reveal essentially the same layout and the same technology of a GE electric kitchen. So with advanced knowledge of US consumer weaponry and a Soviet negotiating team armed with absolute veto power, why did the Kremlin allow deployment of America's most powerful propaganda device within Moscow city limits? Did Khrushchev have an alternate agenda in mind for the American ex exhibition? The answer is yes. Consider these facts unreported at the time. Organizers of the American National Exhibition oded, noted an odd visitor demographic in the opening days. A Macy's representative reported that attendance skewed heavily toward people, quote, obviously of managerial status. The Soviet hosts had distributed all fairground tickets in accordance with the negotiated agreement. Ironically, a classified USIA policy of targeting, quote, the more politically alert and potentially most influential citizens of the Soviet Union seemed also to satisfy the party central committee. Why would the party want to ensure preferential access to America's propagandistic commodity spectacle for its managerial elite? After a night of post-negotiation drinking, Soviet officials provided a plausible explanation to exhibition organizer Chad McClellan, who reported, quote, they want us to serve out of what we exhibit as catalysts to their own Russian people to produce things in Russia which they need and do not now enjoy. This was a shocking surprise to me, end quote. As American officials feared, the party went to great lengths to limit access to the fairgrounds by typical Soviet citizens. Using a classic bait and switch technique, agitators worked the long lines, shouting, why bother with the American exhibit? Go to our own. We've got better things to see and you don't need a ticket. 300 meters away, a competing exhibit titled All For You, Soviet Man, shown below, displayed a cornucopia of new Russian products and prototypes. Of course, some, so, 
Soviet consumer artifacts lagged behind those donated for display by American corporations, but this too would pass, according to a confession made by Khrushchev to Nixon and shared with Pravda. Quote, I do not want to ex conceal the fact that during my inspection of your exhibits, I, ex I experienced to a certain ex degree a feeling of envy. But this is a good envy in the sense that we should like to have all this in our country as soon as possible. We regard the American exhibition as an exhibition of our own achievements in the near future." End quote. For Soviet industrial managers wanting to observe and replicate America's consumer culture, nothing surpassed a visit to the US, as delegates from the Ministry of Construction could attest. But so, few Soviet administers, administrators would have the opportunity to observe US household consumption in situ. In permitting America to stage its commodity extravaganza in Moscow, the Kremlin opted for the next, next best thing. If Soviet managers could not travel to America, why not let America come to them? Sanctioning this consumption-inducing spectacle was just the kind of bold, high-stakes gamble for which Khrushchev was known and which ultimately accounted for his downfall. In one of his fairground exchanges, uh, Khrushchev envisioned the conclusion of his Cold War program of peaceful competition. Quote, in another seven years, we will be on the same level as America. When we catch up, while passing by, we will wave to you. Khrushchev's vow to beat America at its own game quickly became official policy. The seven-year plan for 1959 through 65 pledged that the USSR would outdistance the West in productivity measures across the board. Not to be outdone, East Germany followed suit in 1958, proclaiming that by 1961, quote, consumption of consumer goods will match and surpass per capita consumption in West Germany. Whether the epidemic of op optimism that infected party leadership in 1958 was a case of cynical manipulation or fatal self-delusion remains far from clear. In either case, the result was a revolution in rising expectations. From Khrushchev's mass housing campaigns emerged a new East Bloc identity, the, consum uh, the socialist consumer citizen. The move into a new apartment unit, as Stephen Harris has noted, quote, was the first step that many socialist citizens took in acquiring objects of mass consumption for the home, identifying themselves as consumers, and by extension, comparing themselves to consumerist culture outside the Soviet bloc. But by the late 70s, the East Bloc's planned economic miracle had stalled. As economies sputtered, even partial fulfillment of a Marshall Plan-type social contract based on consumer affluence could only be achieved by increasing foreign debt or cannibalizing investments earmarked for industrial modernization. State socialist standards of living had become false fronts, concealing economic stagnation. Meanwhile, rather than living out the heroic role of a socialist citizenry in the public realm, citizens transformed their private apartment space into the insular outposts of a Nischengesellschaft, or niche society. Wrapped in a cocoon of privacy, provisioned by a shadow economy generated by the inefficiencies of its socialist counterpart, residents withdrew from the public sphere, disrupting the plotline of Marxist history and its teleological narrative of collective progress. Post-war consumption and its modernist material culture proved fatal to the East Bloc. A runaway inflation of consumer desire bankrupted Soviet state socialism, both economically and ideologically. Historians who look for the cause of Soviet Bloc collapse in the Cold War's arms race could do well also to consider the household goods chase initiated by the Marshall Plan some 30 years earlier in divided Berlin. But lest we reduce this story to another form of propaganda, namely a triumphalist tale of Western capitalism vanquishing Soviet socialism, let's take another look at the tract homes celebrated in US propaganda half a century ago. We should not mistake the suburban homes inducted into the Cold War uh, for those we know today, and therein lie the larger stakes of my book. Neither the consumer culture proselytized by the US in the 50s, nor the suburban homes that served as its platform exist today. Or to put it more accurately, both have undergone a mutation so radical that their current generation bears only a passing resemblance to the mid-century progenitors. The model home displayed in Moscow was a typical tract home of about 1,000 square feet. The floor area of the three-car garage, 
appended to over 30% of the homes built in 2006 in the Western US. In half a century, the habitable space of the average new home has increased by 150%, just as average household size has decreased by 23%. This means that in 50 years, the living area per resident has increased by a factor of three. And since residential space doesn't consist of unheated, unfurnished rooms, American domestic expansion has come with dramatically increased consumption. As a result, more natural resources have been used by US citizens just since 1950 than by everyone else, everywhere else in the world, who ever lived before them. In short, the formula for citizen enfranchisement through ever-increasing low-cost mass consumption, once promulgated globally by the Marshall Plan, is costing us the world. Rather than a triumphalist narrative, this study of US Cold War household propaganda should be understood as a cautionary tale. Thank you very much. Thank you. Blair. <clears throat> Well, that's a, a great talk about a great book. I, uh, first, I want to thank Christian for inviting me to participate in this event. Um, one of the fun things of the Kennan Institute at Wilson Center is um, the working with colleagues and the number of different programs here. And the Cold War um, project here has really enriched the Kennan Institute over the years. And I want to thank Christian. It's mutual. Uh, <laughs> it's mutual, and actually it, it's mutual because Greg is a former Kent Institute scholar at one point, so uh, we feel some ownership of the project as well. Um, it's a real honor to be able to comment on Greg's book. I've known Greg for a number of years. I first stumbled across him um, when um, he was working with um, Spiro Kostov, and uh, Greg worked on uh, revisions of Kostov's uh, really magisterial uh, histories of city design. And as I began to understand uh, Greg's role in that, I, I, just, I understood Greg was somebody I really uh, wanted to know and whose work I wanted to follow. And I, I did follow it. And I um, talked to him when he was working on his dissertation and, and read parts of it. And his dissertation on socialist architecture in Berlin was really remarkable for its ability to weave together what was happening simultaneously in East and West German planning design. And I think um, it has produced a number of, of really remarkable articles. And if you're at all interested uh, in that part of, of the work, I, I guess the chapter of the Bauhaus in, the, in Cold War Germany and Bauhaus culture may be the, the, the place to, to go to find that work. But what you immediately, you can sense it from his presentation here, uh, you can sense it from what I just said, what's really, there are two things that are remarkable about Greg's work. <clears throat> it shouldn't be that it's remarkable, but it is. It shouldn't be remarkable because we should all, all of us engaged in intellectual life should try to do this, it seems to me. One is how, there's an intellectual journey that Greg is on, and if you read Greg's work, he takes you along that journey. And one set of questions opens up to another set of questions, which opens up to another set of questions. And the other is, I mean, he didn't start at all with the notion that domesticity is a weapon. He started someplace else, but this project grew out of a line of inquiry. And um, it, it's, really rewarding to follow somebody's work who, who does that. Uh, and the other aspect of Greg's work, which, which I think you clearly have a sense of just from this short presentation, is um, how it testifies to the power of genuinely interdisciplinary scholarship. It's not interdisciplinary scholarship by formula. It's not something from column A and something from column B. It's not something from design and something from international relations. Uh, his work really is uh, a synthetic work that grows out of uh, contemplating and absorbing perspectives from a number of different disciplines. And I, want, I think this point about Greg's work uh, leads me to the first point I want to make about the book. And I'm going to make about a half dozen points about the book. But the first observation is that uh, Cold War on the home front has a depth and a wisdom that comes from approaching 
this particular research question with extensive knowledge from adjacent fields. There's a depth and texture to this work that's often missing, certainly in discussions of the kitchen debate, which become kind of unidimensional uh, discussions about the kitchen it, it's, and the debate within the sweep of Nixon's career or Soviet American relations. But what he shows is that behind that kitchen were a lot of questions about design, about the good life, uh, and he's able to bring together um, a lot of, of texture and more depth to our understanding of, of that debate. Um, on the 50th anniversary of the Sokolniki exhibition, the, a number of the surviving uh, guides from the exhibit gathered at George Washington University, and it was, it was a really um, lovely and fascinating event. Uh, and William Sapphire spoke, I think it was about his last public um, uh, appearance, and he was the PR guy who engineered those press photographs uh, as part of his already uh, his, thinking about his efforts to promote Nixon's candidacy as president. Um, Sapphire told about how he was underneath the table you see in that book and how he was pushing the American press and how, in fact, as far as the U.S. government officials were concerned, the kitchen wasn't going to be the center point. The center point was supposed to be the um, RCA TV, uh, color TV uh, studio, which really was the sort of high-tech miracle of, of the moment. So I think uh, one of the lessons that you can uh, glean from Greg's work is, is how these different pieces come together at a moment in history, pieces which you wouldn't normally think about coming together in quite the way that they did. And that comes out of, obviously, the, the depth of, of knowledge that Greg brings to the project. There's a second somewhat related piece that I think is very important, and he highlighted it in, in uh, his presentation here. Many of us who have approached the Cold War through Moscow think of the kitchen debate or similar events as a kind of beginning point. And I think what emerges from, from Greg's work here is a very important point, that um, the kitchens were, to mix a metaphor, test-driven in Germany long before, that a lot of what happened in, in the Cold War uh, involving the Americans and the Soviets happened in Germany long before it happened in the uh, U.S.-Soviet relationship. Uh, and that Germany and Eastern Europe um, were uh, really where a lot of the initial uh, probing uh, took place. And we know this in the Berlin conference, uh, conflicts and, and so on. But it's, I, I think it's an important reminder. And the kitchen debate, your comment in your presentation about how the kitchen debate was really the end of the kitchen wars, not the beginning, I think is a reminder of how we need to think about the Cold War in general. The third point brings me to how we think about the Soviet Union and about housing. <coughs> and Greg's work, it's interesting, we were talking about this, there's now a field of the study of Soviet architecture and design and urban planning and, and planning in, in general. And Greg has been in the forefront of what is now an emerging field. Uh, in addition to, this, to his work about the kitchen, uh, there's uh, Steve Harris's work on, on Khrushchev era apartments. Uh, there are other works on housing in Czechoslovakia. On Mark Smith has a work on uh, Soviet urban housing. All of this body of literature, I think, underscores a really important point about the Cold War, which we tend to forget now. It was a total war. It wasn't a war just about bombs and rockets and missiles and throwaways. It was a battle about very different conceptions of the good life. And it was a battle in which perhaps not just the kitchen, but the Beatles were more important for ultimately winning uh, than uh, Star Wars missiles, the missile defense. And we talk about how one single American president won the Cold War or one single weapons program won the Cold War, we really lose sight of what a total war uh, this was. 
The Soviet Union didn't fail because it didn't know how to build rockets. It built rockets very well. It failed because of its inability to sustain lifestyles that people wanted. And Greg's work illustrates this point uh, very, very well. But it also illustrates another aspect of this. Looking back at the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, from the kind of imperial Oz of, of the Ronald Reagan building, we, we kind of uh, think, well, of course, it was preordained. Of course, we had a better lifestyle. Of course, people wanted to live like we did. But when you go back and examine the 1950s, you understand that rational, intelligent people could think about an alternative outcome in which a socialist lifestyle was deemed to be the better life by rational, intelligent people. The outcome of this story was not preordained. And you see it in the German reactions to the original um, exhibitions about the houses. In the end, millions of human beings decided uh, they liked the Beatles, they liked color televisions that didn't incinerate their apartments, they didn't want the best black and white TVs ever produced, which the Soviet Union was producing by the, the 1970s. They wanted an extra room or two. They, they wanted that big house that we now have, which maybe none of us uh, can afford. And I think there are really important lessons here for how we think about soft power and we think about the American position in the world. Um, you talked about the sort of McCarthy-era congressional skepticism about soft power. Well, of course, there is contemporary skepticism about soft power uh, right now. And, um, and also, um, I, I, I was taken a little bit aback by the 1952 exhibit slogan, this man is a worker as well as a consumer. Well, if this man is a worker, then he has to be paid enough in order to consume. And that seems to be, uh, there's, those linkages seem to be a little bit absent in our thinking right now as well. But this also gets to my fourth point. If it was a total war, it involved total mobilization. And part of the story of, of these exhibits is how all of American society was mobilized just as all of Soviet society was mobilized. Congress didn't appropriate the money. Corporations stepped up to the plate. The leading architectural and design schools in the country were involved. They were involved because they, they were very much involved in trying to what? Defeat the Soviets. We easily understand that the Soviet Union was a mobilization society on a war footing. But we were too. And you begin to sense that in, in Greg's work. And I think that that's an important reminder for uh, what was happening. Uh, there are two other points I, I, I want to make. Um, one actually has to do um, more uh, when he's writing about East German economists and, the, and socialist economists. And all of us who have worked in the housing field in the socialist world understand this, because you go to the architectural journals, and by the 70s, late 60s, you begin to get all of these contorted efforts to try to f measure the appropriate standard of living for the average person. And uh, you get architectural journals with little art, uh, sociological charts and everything else. And one of the lessons out of that which I took away from reading this is we really need to be careful when we use quantitative metrics to measure qualitative outcomes. This is a lesson which we seem to be forgetting now. But when you take a look at the, the writing, I don't know about the East German writing, but I certainly know about the Soviet writing, on what constituted the ideal home or the ideal services for the ideal citizen, you realize how, what a slippery slope using quanti uh, qu quantitative measures can be to judge qualitative outcomes. And I was reminded, because the East German connection, when I was at the Social Science Research Council in the 1980s, uh, we were supporting uh, programs trying to encourage uh, e economists to study socialist economists. And there was a really mind-blowing, elegant presentation of a mathematical um, 
econometrics study of the East German economy that concluded without a doubt that living standards in East Germany were higher in West, than in West Germany. And um, I was sort of reminded of those calculations. This is more from the book than the presentation because you didn't really talk about the, yeah. the socialist response. But it's another reason why you should read the book. Um, and um, finally, the, he also didn't really talk about this, but uh, there's a design aspect to this book. And I was reminded, again, something we forget, of how revolutionary modern design was and how startling uh, these images of these kitchens and homes were. And you know, part of the story of the 20th century is how Bauhaus went from being uh, a revolutionary ideology to uh, the iconic representation of global corpora corporations. Um, and you actually sort of are a reminder of why it is that modern design started out being revolutionary before it was, uh, before it became the favored style on Park Avenue. Uh, and that's another important reason to read the book. And that also gets, it, gets back to the f my first point, that what's really delightful about engaging Greg's work is how it really is multidisciplinary in the best sense of that word, that he has made his own assimilated a number of different issues from a number of different uh, disciplinary perspectives and what he writes really becomes startling new, startlingly new because of it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you for your very thoughtful comments, Blair. Floor is open for questions and, and comments. If you could please wait for the microphone. Let me perhaps, um, start by just um, asking Greg to just uh, split a little bit uh, what your sources are. Blair actually got to some of this already, but if this is uh, broader than the um, diplomatic, military, uh, intelligence materials uh, we deal here, we deal with here at the, at the Cold War Projects, I'd like you to please. Well, the, the um, uh, sources are pretty much all over the place. So they include uh, the records from the National Archives here in College Park. Uh, in uh, Berlin, uh, many of the records of uh, the uh, German National Archives, which now include party records. And actually the delightful thing about East Germany is, after all, they were Germans. And the way <laughs> records were kept is just a dream. Uh, you might find them, you know, in a funny piece of yellowed paper tied up with a piece of twine, but everything is there. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and then things like um, oral history interviews. It's really pretty much a grab bag of wherever I could find things. And then, of course, publications, newspapers. So it's, it, it uses uh, pretty much whatever I could find that was available. Good. All right. So go to Boris first. I'm sorry, Sonia, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, okay. uh, Sonia Michelle, Director of U.S. Studies here at the Wilson Center. Um, this is a terrific book. I'm really looking forward to reading it after hearing about it, and I especially love the visuality of it. I'm a historian, but I always deal, end up dealing with text, so I always envy the people who really see history um, visually. Um, I have two questions that are kind of related. One is that especially home design and especially kitchen design is really about gender roles, and I'm wondering to what extent uh, gender roles were part, uh, transforming gender roles were part of the vision of the designers at any point, and also um, how they, uh, how people responded to them. Um, I mean, American, it seems to me that American home design, and especially kitchen design, was to make women, I mean, the assumption was that women would be in the home and it was to make their roles easier, but the Soviets, of course, had a different view of what women should be doing, and so I'm wondering to what extent the, uh, you know, attempts to catch up with the U.S. in terms of home design was an attempt to get women back in the kitchen or to make the double burden that, that Soviet women had to face better? Or, you know, were there, did you come across any women's feminist responses to, this, to these kinds of things? Um, that's one question. The other question has to do with another kind of inequality, and that's racial inequality. And, of course, all of the time that the U.S. was boasting about the fact that everybody had these wonderful homes, African Americans and other racial minorities were not getting into these homes for all kinds of reasons. Um, did that come up? Uh, the Soviets, I know, used uh, accusations about racial inequality in other uh, areas, and I'm wondering if that 
came up around these these uh, around this question too. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Clearly, uh, much of home design and uh, uh, especially kitchen design is an issue of gender. And so uh, in many ways, I think in that second room in the We're Building a Better Life exhibition where the poster says, this man is a worker and at the same, kind of, at the same time a consumer, I think it's very specifically a cue to men to take what they're about to see seriously. So I think they're, they're being addressed to pop out of their gender expectations. But there is a, uh, in the, the chapter three of that book, which discusses that particular exhibition, which I think was quite an important one, there is a, a rather extensive discussion about the ideal family represented by a young woman, a young man, and their two children. And one has to remember that in uh, Germany, especially in Berlin, West Berlin in 1952, that was not at all a typical family. And the people who were left out of that equation were something like at least a fifth to a quarter of a population of single women who may have lost their husbands, older women, women who were single parents, who were supporting uh, children, sometimes supporting elderly adults, and they basically drop out of the conversation in a way that was quite typical of West Germany at the time. In other words, uh, they were reminders of a kind of unspeakable past, and they were shunted aside in terms of a vision of what West Germany had as an ideal, an ideal that essentially wanted to look forward and didn't want to spend a moment looking backwards. Um, and yes, there are interesting responses to especially the Soviet exhibition in terms of women's roles. And what I talk about in the book is that we from the West always talk about the kitchen debate, which is the Nixon Khrushchev. But there was another kitchen debate, which also involved Nixon and Khrushchev. And it took place in the RCA Miracle Kitchen, which was this smoke and mirrors, high tech, a wizardry room that was devised actually for American audiences in the late 50s and then exported as part of this privatization of uh, public diplomacy. And uh, Soviet responses, which of course are, end up appearing in places like Pravda, so they have been sort of screened, were incredibly uh, sort of negative on the Miracle uh, Kitchen, saying that it was a place in which women were uh, it's sort of like a gilded cage for capitalist women. So the interesting thing is their media really focused much more on kitchen debate too, uh, which almost didn't appear at all in our, med in our media, in which Khrushchev says to Nixon, you know, looking at all the gizmos that were frankly displayed there, things like rheostats to turn the color of the light in the kitchen from bluish to reddish, depending on the housewife's mood, little television screens to let them know what's happening in different parts of the house. Khrushchev asks, oh, and do you have a machine here that chews food and puts it down your throat too? <laughs> so that was really the Soviet media's kitchen debate, not the one that we focus on in the West. Oh, and then racial inequality. Uh, yeah, there, this was a really, racial inequality was a, a place where Soviet propagandists had a wonderful time because every time the U.S. tried to counter it with some uh, positive propaganda, uh, uh, congressional senators would basically say, nothing doing. That's, that sounds like it was put out by Reds. This is like communist propaganda, get it out of our presentation. So for example, in the 1958 Brussels exhibition, there was a, a separate pavilion called Unfinished Business, which tried to address American problems in terms of urban renewal, uh, racial inequality, and problems with uh, what we would take today called ecology, then it was called conservation. And that uh, exhibition, showed that America was gradually coming to some terms with race. One of the, one of the images that incensed uh, Southern uh, congressmen was an image of uh, black and white children playing together. The, ex the exhibition unit was closed and photographers removed from it, so they didn't see that image being pulled down and in just a few weeks, the entire exhibition was closed. So uh, essentially, uh, 
you know, uh, American, the reaction of uh, American senators from the South created this wide field for c the Communist Party propagandists to work in because we couldn't touch the topic. It was the third rail, basically. Mm -hmm. Boris? I'm Boris Lanin, a Woodrow Wilson Center fellow. Hello. Um, I have a question. Um, probably you can explain why, with such attention towards uh, uh, home design, Soviets didn't have journals for good housekeeping. They have uh, Rabotnitsa, working woman. They had uh, Kristianka, peasant woman. And there was no good housekeeping, just two. Well, gender aspect exists here as well. Mm -hmm. And they had only one page in monthly science and life journal, how to do something from nothing. <laughs> and and uh, they had a special, uh, a special monthly magazine, Do It Yourself, Zelesan. That was it. And just observation, um, look, though, uh, though, you know, um, apartment comfort and apartment standards were much higher in East Germany, people were ready to take risk and jump over the wall or rush through the wall or whatever. So good housekeeping, probably has not too much with good life. Uh, they're both very good points. Uh, I think the first one you may have answered with your own comment that the column was called making something from nothing. So we have good housekeeping in the West, uh, that's these type of magazines, because they actually serve a function in that it's where potential consumers meet producers as negotiated by the editors of the magazine. So that's a position in that transaction that those editors want to monopolize and they do it and accrue profits from it. Uh, East Germany did have homemaking magazines and they would get letters, one of which I have in the book, that said things like, you know, I think that your, the beautiful things you show exist in some world of dreams and fantasy. Uh, when are we going to find these things in our store? Please don't answer from the perspective of building socialism. Uh, I'm sick of your disgusting excuses and so forth. So I think this is precisely the reason why the Soviet Union, with even greater supply problems for having a consistent uh, sort of uh, a group of things that you would find in the store if you wanted them. If you saw that in the magazine, you know, you would have to be able to go into uh, a state shop and, and expect to find them. If that isn't there, then there's a really good reason not to have uh, the homemaking magazine. Uh, the second point is well taken as well. Uh, and I think there are other scholars who have talked about this. It's not my idea, but it's really very clear that one of the things that East Germans were starving for was travel and mobility. And so uh, clearly having a house full of stuff that's nice is one thing, but not to be able to travel was probably one of the m most difficult aspects of socialist life that uh, faced East Germans. And so uh, it's pretty clear that they were actually very mobile. They went all over Yugoslavia, Romania, Hungary to do their camping trips, but as soon as that border was open, they rushed it. So I think this uh, lack of uh, free travel, uh, which is also an area of consumption, it's touristic consumption, that's the consumer uh, sort of commodity that they were denied. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk and a, a wonderful um, set of questions and comments raised. Um, I was wondering, because I, I'm a 20th century European historian focusing on the West, and um, the design element is new to me, in a sense, other than just what I know from being the active consumer and making things out of nothing and so on. Um, <laughs> is there a specific Cold War aesthetic in design other than or operating within this modernism? Is it something different? 
Um, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit, which I imagine might be in the book, about these design elements. And I ask this because I, I wonder as you're talking, and this is an, an example of bringing up further questions, right? Um, how did American consumers feel about this if, if they knew this was happening? Is there something that's working subliminally with them that they know that this is promoting the Cold War? Like you see a sleek toaster and you think this is the US and the Cold War. So they're, they're kind of interrelated, but I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the, the physicality of it. Okay. Um, I th I w uh, the notion of is there a Cold War style is so, uh, sort of large and actually sort of contentious among art historians that I'd have you take a look at the catalog from the wonderful Victoria and Albert show, Cold War Modern, which came out about two years ago. But there are probably a number of uh, sort of parallel Cold War design trends. Clearly, you have East and West, but even within the West, there are sort of anti-consumer trends. There are sort of ironic design trends. And so there, there probably are a lot of things we can associate with the Cold War, not a, a single nominal Cold War design. Uh, uh, but it, it's a very rich topic, and that's where you'll find material on it. Uh, the second issue, what did American audiences think? In fact, American audiences were specifically kept, uh, not kept abreast of this information. Uh, there w was a uh, federal statute enjoining uh, people like the Marshall Plan and the MSA from using the propaganda devised for foreign audiences in the U.S. So even the films made by the Marshall Plan were not allowed to be shown in the U.S. until maybe five years ago. So American audiences basically didn't know the real content of the propaganda. They were only given uh, sort of echoes of it through the news media, but that also was propaganda because the Eisenhower administration had a very clear and uh, clearly delineated policy of propaganda purged of its original source. So they would essentially uh, dry clean propaganda by pumping it through public media sources to get back to publics in Europe and, of course, in the U.S. too. Yeah. Michael Binder, Air Force Declassification Office. A question and a comment. The question, I'm wondering if there were similar home decor shows in other parts of the world sponsored by the United States that did not embrace any kind of a Cold War theme, a Cold War strategy. The comment has to do with what Mr. Rubel said about the Cold War being a total war and total mobilization. I couldn't disagree more strongly. As a military historian, to say that is to um, disparage the American and the world experience during World War II. The Cold War was a fractional war. There was very small mobilization. It was distinct from other periods of American history that we did have permanent mobilization, but the number of participants on our side really participating in the day-to-day -day Cold War was pretty small in terms of the total American military. And if it had gone hot, then everybody would have been participating and you would have had essentially total mobilization. But as a cold, cold war, I really think, my own perspective, you should focus on more of the military aspects. Okay, I think that was to both of you, so where do you want to start? Yeah, no, I, I actually disagree with you in the following way. I think the nature of mobilization changes, and you have the militarization of a number of American institutions which were not militarized, well, they weren't, World War II is obviously, you know, that is total war and there's no doubt about it. But when you take a look, for example, at the changes in American higher education, that begin in response particularly to the Sputnik event. You have a transformation of funding of American higher education. You have a transformation of how research is supported. What Greg's book shows very clearly is there were corporations that were, were engaging in international propaganda, and, and we needed it. I'm, I'm not saying that this was a bad thing but they were engaging in new ways in which they didn't before. 
you are correct. The, the, when you talk about military mobilization, but even there when you take a look at the weapons projects, the impact that that had on the American economy, I just refer you in the end to uh, Eisenhower's farewell speech. What happened during the 50s is, is a different kind, it, it, it's a different kind of mobilization, but it affects everything because the outcome of the Cold War determined how we were going to live, if we were going to live. And I think, I, I think we need to consider the ways in which that experience changed American society. And it changed it in every aspect. So even if you were correct, the actual allocation to the military doesn't match World War II at all. Uh, in some ways, uh, when you had rationing and, and uh, other aspects of World War II which, which do not continue, you are correct. It wasn't as visible. There were f profound changes in how Americans organized the American economy and organized big chunks of it. And just look at higher education. Uh, you know, language training, we were all trained because of the Sputnik in languages. That, that, it, those are aspects of American society that were transformed by the fact that we were opposed to the Soviet Union. corporate propaganda, those things happen, they happened during the Cold War era, but did they end at the end of the Cold War, when the Cold War ended? If they didn't, then I would say that it's not part of the Cold War. I, but that's the view of a military historian. Yeah, no, I would, ju I would just say, and we're, we're obviously, we're going to end up disagreeing on this, so if that, well, fair enough, uh, but uh, I, I would say that there are some aspects of that which do come to an end at the end of the Cold War. Uh, and uh, I think that you, we'd have to ask an economist what the peace dividend was, but um, there, there is a drifting away of attention, for example, to foreign languages, which happens in the 1990s. I think any of us who have been responsible for, for programming and uh, in, in area studies sees that very clearly. It, it turned around after 9-11, but um, uh, there, w there was a kind of decommissioning. I, I don't think that the kinds of corporations Greg's talking about being involved in these exhibits really could have cared less in the 1990s about American exhibits. The American exhibit budget falls off. Um, so I, I really do think uh, it, it's, not, it's not a total change. Some, the, the dependency of, say, institutions of higher learning on on the federal government is certainly in a totally different place in the 1990s than it was in the 1930s, no question about it. But, when, but there was a backing away in the 1990s from a number of, of these kinds of activities. But we're not going to resolve this here, so it's, it's a, but thank you. Um, as for the uh, home decor show, the show I showed uh, of 1952, uh, We're Building a Better Life, was repackaged and also sent to Milan, to, uh, you know, France, and then other shows that were produced in the U.S. were spectacularly unsuccessful when sent to Bogota, Colombia, to uh, Colombo, Sri Lanka, to India. In other words, um, the whole notion of showing the American good life as lived out by a white American family was just not uh, transferable all over the world. So they, the, there were attempts to use this kind of propaganda everywhere, but it, it was not really successful. They do the same thing in Japan. Well, I don't know about Japan. Sorry. No. Okay, any, we'll go. Yeah. A little bit of time. Comments with the World Bank. Uh, my question is that, oh, I think. Okay. Okay. So in those kind of debate, is any, uh, was there some kind of topic about the healthcare uh, system? If uh, I'm, uh, uh, for example, like the Cuba, they, when they do uh, their propaganda, they very emphasize how good their universal coverage for healthcare system. Did the USSR also do the same propaganda? If yes, what's the uh, effect? If not, why they do? Uh, for the US. No, for, for the USSR, if they do. Right. Uh, the USSR clearly, um, uh, sort of had uh, propaganda based on healthcare, 
but they had propaganda based on all aspects of Soviet life, which were said to be better than all aspects of capitalist life. So uh, one aspect of the healthcare uh, propaganda is that Soviet propaganda often, especially sent to the West, tended to be done in heroic tones, which sort of seemed, uh, the West was a little bit, people, Western audiences were a little incredulous. They often, the Soviets, uh, emphasized high technology of healthcare, and that's exactly what the U.S. did in, for example, a uh, show that traveled throughout Europe, Adams for Peace, which was actually a way of trying to lower the temperature of uh, Western Europeans when they knew that America was sort of stocking up bases with atomic weapons in their countries. Uh, they really pushed things like the way that radioisotopes could be used for uh, advanced health care. So there were some of those issues. Um, the, I haven't seen a lot of American propaganda specifically uh, talking about uh, the high quality of health care. Uh, that I don't think was a major emphasis. Okay, we're almost out of time. Let's take two final questions. We'll go all the way back. Alexey Antoshin, Canadian Institute School. My question is: uh, Some modern historians think that uh, sometimes propaganda of American way of life was even dangerous for real struggle against communism as uh, because some Soviet and Eastern German intellectuals uh, simply escaped to the uh, Western American way of uh, life and as a result they didn't think about, uh, about real situation around them. Uh, they uh, um, uh, didn't find uh, ways uh, for struggle against regime. Uh, it's a very <laughs> difficult problem. Uh, what, what do you think about it? <laughs> uh, uh, if you could clarify that the idea is that the intellectuals in the USSR and East Bloc in becoming entranced with an American way of life would no longer struggle internally for an, as an attempt in a sense just to escape, to come to the West or Regime, yes, because uh, it was enough for them, yes, uh, uh, to live as Americans, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh huh. Um, I, you know, I'm not really sure about that. Would uh, now is the argument that they would be living at this higher quality of life in the USSR and within the East Bloc, or by escaping from the USSR and the East Bloc? I think this, uh, the, most of the propaganda initiatives that I look at in this book occur between around 47 and through uh, the early 1960s. The uh, situation that you're talking about is probably a much later one. Uh, and by that time, the U.S. had really scaled down uh, arguments about the American way of life. In, in many ways, uh, as even within Western Europe, as Western Europe, European uh, standards of living rose, much of this propaganda became ineffective. So, you know, the American kitchen was a big deal as far as propaganda in 1950. By around 1960, the U.S. was choosing not even to bother putting wonder kitchens in European, Western European shows anymore because Western Europeans had things that were just as impressive. Yeah. Okay, final question over here. <clears throat> I'm a food historian at the Smithsonian American History Museum. I'm working on an exhibit, also part of this time period. And I know that Khrushchev came to the U.S., to San Francisco, to tour a safe way. And I'm wondering if you came across that and also how that was handled because that was domestic and not foreign USA effort. I don't even know whose effort it was. 
but maybe you came across that. And also I heard the Queen of England also toured a supermarket when she came to the US. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to know how, if that mm. was also a source of competition and also, um, you know, how uh, suburban homes really enabled the growth mm -hmm. of the supermarket so mm -hmm. people could store food in home refrigerators mm -hmm. and freezers. Uh, yeah, the, actually the supermarket was um, a real sort of topic of propaganda. For example, uh, many of the USIA shows from around 57 to 59 had supermarkets in them, model supermarkets. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about was in this book, one of the kind of unsung heroes of American propaganda efforts was a designer named, uh, uh, now I'm not going to remember his name, Peter, uh, oh, okay, sorry about that. Uh, Peter Hardenden, thanks. Uh, and he was schooled in Yale Architecture School, then he became an American information specialist in the Second World War and afterwards. And one of his uh, qualities of genius was that with this scaling down of federal funds for uh, foreign propaganda and its privatization, its takeover by corporate donations, uh, Hardenden took these individual pieces and very masterfully combined them in new thematic organizations, which in some ways were even more powerful than the earlier, his earlier work for the Marshall Plan. So for example, he would combine a model kitchen and a model, uh, um, and a, uh, model supermarket to explain the relationship of industrialization of the food process and agriculture and how that got to the kitchen, all a kind of collage of different uh, corporate donated things. Uh, so this was really clearly uh, an important effort, and probably the, the peak of that effort is a show in uh, Yugoslavia, which is called Supermarket USA, which uh, there's a chapter on in that book, uh, The Cold War Kitchen, which is an anthology. And Supermarket USA actually had uh, military planes flying in fresh produce from Pennsylvania to be able to restock the supermarket shelves in the, in the model supermarket, yeah. Great, I think we've uh, come to an end. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Blair, for a very rich and fascinating afternoon. Thank you. Also, my thanks to uh, our, our uh, Canon uh, colleague, Joe Dressen, who's been manning the mic, uh, in part since my colleague, Alison Lyakov, who has organized, helped organize the event, is still on crutches, and can fly across the table like Joe does, to pass on the mic. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we're adjourned. Thank you very much.